there. Wow. That's fabulous. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so tonight we are about to start our Ask a Naturalist slideshow, which has the questions that people sent in. But I want to just give everybody a heads up. For however many months, I think we started Ask a Naturalist in April. Um, tonight, we are turning the tables on, on you guys. We have, we're going to answer some questions that people send in, but then we have some slides in this thing that we're going to ask you to identify. And what we're going to do is we'll, at, we'll put up the slide and we'll say, whoever has the first correct chat in the chat function will win a prize, a Harris Center prize tonight. And the prizes that are we're offering are our um, khaki Harris Center hats, baseball hats. So um, get ready. This is going to be, you can't just sleep during this because um, we'll have some questions for you. But we'll start with some questions from last time that were stumpers. So this was one of the questions that we had was this very strange um, item found on a stump, found on a moss covered log in the woods of Vermont. What are they and who might have collected them? So this was a very interesting um, discovery and we did figure out what they are. And I wonder if there is one of our um, experts, our panelists want to just confirm what they are. And I talked to another expert that can um, shed some light on what they're doing there. So anybody want to take what, away what that is? Phil or Brett, maybe. So a deadening silence. Da -da -da -da. I can remember they're Dutchman britches. Karen Siever, you know, tell us about those. What are those things from the Dutchman britches? Yeah, they're they're. I mean, if you've ever planted garlic. They're a lot like that in terms of how they would um, make one of these little, I think they would technically be called a corm, I think would be the plant term for these bulbs. Um, and you could each of them would break apart and then form a whole little plant. So if you've ever seen a Dutchman breeches, they're a very cool sort of uh, spring ephemeral wildflower where the, the plant actually looks like kind of like a pair of pants, I guess, if you uh, use your imagination a little bit, sort of like um, kind of more kind of bloomers, I guess, for like under a skirt, which is kind of cool. Uh, so clearly somebody's been hoarding them because they uh, must be pretty tasty. And like any sort of tuber, there's uh, the plant is storing a lot of uh, rich chemicals in these. So these would presumably have a lot of nutrition to offer the, the mammal casher. All right. And so I did a little bit of research on um, who was caching it. And I had to reach out to my go-to expert. Um, whenever I am stumped with something in the natural world, I go to um, my old mentor and teacher, professor from Antioch, um, Dr. Rick Vandepoel. If anybody's ever been out in the woods with Dr. Rick or Dr. V as we call him, um, he probably could tell you the scientific name for almost anything you pointed to in the woods and he'd have some fascinating information about it as well. He's incredible. And I sent this slide to him and he, he said that his best thought on this was um, the pine bowl. Um, so um, we have that they that these um, Dutchman's bre breeches or Dutchman's bloomers, as I like Karen describing them, um, grow in the same place where the pine vole is, and that this is pine vole behavior. Although he said he wouldn't stake his house on it, it could also be a mouse. We having a big mouse here, um, but mice are more hoardings uh, hoarding of fruit. And voles are more kind of, as we know, if you've ever had any bulbs eaten by voles, um, voles really like the tubers and the fruit and the um, bulbs. So that's the answer to that as best as we can guess. And um, Pam, thank you so much for sending in that mystery. It took us twice to ask a naturalist to answer it. And we have another one. So Miles, here's our next one. Okay, so this is really, this is the stumper 
from last week. <laughs> I found this extensive pool of sap at the base of an apparently very healthy black cherry in my yard. The tree had no visible wounds, though I could see the sap bleeding from beneath multiple scales. Any thoughts? And this was from our very own Eric Masterson. Eric, do you wanna add any more detail to that before I turn it over to John? Yeah, so Jeremy had suggested <clears throat> may, perhaps there was a wound higher up in the tree. And so you can see the leaves sticking to the trunk, uh, the, the glue being the sap. And so I did go out and uh, try and, I, I'm having difficulty um, looking up these days, but I did get my wife to look up and we scanned, we scanned the uh, tree for wounds and we couldn't find any. We couldn't find any. So I, I am stumped like Jeremy on this one. I heard a rumor around town that John Benjamin knows the, perhaps the answer to this. So John, what, can you help us? What is this? I can offer a hypothesis. I definitely don't know for sure. Um, but given the um, possibility of a fungal pathogen coming to mind, I did do a little bit of research to see what uh, might have been possibly a cause of so much sap leaking out that might have been caused by a fungal disease. And there is um, a, a pretty common uh, disease of cherries in all members of the stone fruit family, the prunus genus. Uh, so that includes cherries and plums and nectarines, and it's called the leucostoma canker, uh, which is a, a pretty problematic fungal disease for all of those uh, fruit trees in the Northeast. And uh, from what I understand, you know, it's a little outside of my wheelhouse uh, with as far as uh, fungus knowledge goes, but um, from reading about it, you know, it will uh, infect trees from wounds. So if there's damage at all uh, from even just small twigs, the spores can, uh, you know, get inside past the bark of the tree and begin growing and, you know, start to cause a lot of damage inside the tree. And um, from what I was reading, um, it's actually the cooler months when a lot of the damage happens because the mycelium can grow when it's even just barely above freezing outside. Uh, and when it's warmer in the summer, the tree can actually be more active in creating, uh, you know, sequestering off the, uh, the fungus damage and, and, you know, preventing it from spreading. But in the, the cooler months is actually when the fungus can really uh, do a lot more damage on the tree. And one symptom is you will, will get a lot of sap oozing out. Um, and what's curious, I mean, as you discussed last week, is that there's not a lot of signs of, of evidence of damage or, you know, scars or, you know, uh, cankers, which is usually what you'll find uh, with these trees that are infected. But again, I mean, potentially there could be some very small uh, bits of damage, even just on twigs or buds, and that could be enough theoretically for the leucostoma fungus to get into the cherry. So it's just one hypothesis about it. John, there, so can you just say the name of the fungus again? And then there's a question of wondering, is that the same as a honey fungus? Uh, so yeah, leucostoma, L-E-U-C-O-S-T-O-M-A. It's the genus and there's there's a couple species, uh, leucostoma persuni and leucostoma uh, synctum. Uh, hope you're all writing this down for the, the test later. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so the someone said honey canker. Is that what was the question? Yeah, honey fungus or honey canker. Uh, okay, so honey fungus. Well, honey. I'm not quite sure if you mean honey mushrooms, which are a big pathogen of oak trees. Um, and that's a different a different species certainly. Um, and that's uh, if that's what you're referring to, it's a very common uh, you know mushroom species that will that will see fruiting in the late summer. Um, they are an edible mushroom, but they're definitely a big um, pathogen on, especially our oak trees. They'll, they'll you know, get into the, uh, the roots and cause butt rot, as they sometimes say. So it sort of cause, I know, that's true. That's what it's called. But that, that's definitely, uh, if that's what you're referring to, it's definitely a difference. No, it looks like it's honey fungus, which is different. Like, um, and it's, it seems as though it's really specific to fruit trees. Okay, yeah. So. You know, again, I'm not the biggest, you know, uh, tree pathogen experts. So I know, you know, Jeremy probably has a lot of knowledge that I don't have <laughs> some of these diseases, but that, that's what I was able to, to dig up with my research. Jeremy, do you have anything you want to add now that we put you on the hot spot? Or are you stumped? I'm just as stumped as last week. Although we, you know, we mentioned that it was potentially a canker or some other kind of wound that was forming. What's extraordinary is just the amount of sap down below the tree. And it's going to be really interesting to see if this tree leaves out in the spring and, and is alive, you know, or, or is really showing signs of, of a pathogen attack here. So Eric, yeah, Eric. Eric is on, Eric is the one who has to follow this tree. 
we well, need to know what happens to it. This is part of three trees, one of which we had taken down, and it was <clears throat> they were um, they're very healthy trees, and healthy to the extent that um, the 16 foot saw log that that came from the tree that was taken down, I gave to Carl von Mertens. And he came back a week later with a kitchen table that he made for me. So it's beautiful wood. So there was not much damage to it. So I'll be, I'll be watching this. I, my concern is that if it rots, it's gonna fall on the house. So I, I'll be watching it, I'll let you know. All right, thanks, good. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to this. And, and now we'll move on to here. Ah, here is the very first opportunity for us to turn the tables on you. <laughs> These are good. I think we have to give it to Pat. I think so. She's I think close. Pat, she was the first to the answer. And maybe Eric, can you tell us, can you get really specific? What is this cross bill and what is it doing here? Well, she I'm gonna let, let Phil take this because he's, okay. he's been looking at these guys on Pac-Man Adnock all, all fall. Yeah, um, well, I, I see that Pat does not want a hat though. So maybe somebody else can jump in with the- with Maybe the have a second, do we have a <laughs> second? Uh -huh. Person, I still still haven't seen the right answer. Written. Okay. It just came through. It just came through. Did it come through. Oh, Andrea Grossman. Are we yeah. taking two bard? Well, um, that oh okay. I'm sorry. So two bard <laughs> is the European name for white wing crossbow. Oh okay. Oh all right. I, okay, yeah. so it sounds like we'll have to give um, Andrea the European hat, the baseball oh. hat for her European answer. And Phil, tell yeah, us about I remember, I remember these particular crossbills on a day when I believe Mead was up at Pacman Adnock that was photographed on top of a red spruce tree. Um, white winged crossbills were starting to flock into the area in late fall. And um, Pacman Adnock and the other spruce dominated summits of the Manadnock region were just loaded with these, these wonderful visitors from the north they're usually in Canada and far northern New Hampshire, but some years they run out of a food source where they usually are. This happens to be one of those eruption years. So white-winged crossbills are showing up now, even away from the high elevations and right in our own backyards down in the, in the low-lying regions. I, I heard one over my house today, so they're, uh, they're around. They don't usually come to bird feeders, but once in a while you might catch one or two there. Um, but they have this unique crossed bill that is designed for specially extracting seeds of pine and spruce and other conifers. Uh, they use their tongue to, to pry the seeds out too. So um, uh, great, great species. Um, the advantage of a crossed bill. Well, yeah, it's, um, it, it's interesting. Yeah, seeing that mechanism in action um, you get an idea of how they how they can pry apart some of the the bracts of the pine cones to get at the seeds, but um, you know usually I don't get that good of a look at it. It's a uh, it's a distant thing, but that cross bill is designed for prying the uh, the, the the bracts and and um, getting at the seeds. So that and the combination of the tongue do the work. Good job and great great answer, Phil, and um, fabulous teamwork from everybody, um, excitement. Don't worry, there'll be two more um, turn the tables questions. So if you really wanna win a hat or you just wanna try and answer, you'll have another chance. This is so interesting. This is once you hardly ever see. I have a white porcupine in my backyard. It usually arrives at dusk and stays for a few hours eating clover. Do you think he's an albino porcupine? I have questions about him. Please advise. So yes, indeed. Um, this falls in my wheelhouse as a person who, who's focused on mammals in my work. And this is an albino porcupine. Um, and there aren't that many albino porcupines. I think recent studies show there's one in 10,000 porcupines will be an albino. And this is um, not the first albino porcupine that I've seen in this area. And um, you can tell it's albino. It's got the fully white quills and you can kind of make out its eye. It's looking not dark, but reddish. Um, so uh, albinos will have reddish eyes um, and they're, they're uncommon. Um, and when you find one this size, this is this porcupine is not that small. 
pretty good. It survived, um, which is also unusual. A lot of times albinos, um, albino wildlife gets eaten first because they stand out until they get a day like today. So if this albino porcupine has survived to today, it's probably going to be okay for a while. It's really going to have an advantage over the regular colored porcupine. Um, it doesn't impact its livelihood. It's able to go around and, and do its own, th own thing and survive. And um, I emailed with Linda, and I don't know if she's here this evening, um, but she was seeing them in the early autumn. And this is pretty typical early, early autumn behavior um, and spring when they'll come and they'll eat the greens, the grasses, the clovers, the dandelions, those kind of fresh greens. And right now, um, porcupines um, kind of habitat has shifted um, and they have shifted away from kind of field landscape to hemlock groves. And they typically find a winter den really located near a bunch of hemlocks. And you, this is a great chance for you to kind of wander around and see porcupine tracks. They'll go from their den, which is often under some rocks um, or granite overhangs, and they'll come out from that. They'll kind of waddle their way up to the um, top of the hemlock. They'll feed on the hemlock. Sometimes they even fall asleep up there on a warm um, day. They're, they're crepuscular. So um, then they'll come back and they use the same trail. They kind of make like a run or a highway. And so you can really find their tracks. You can follow them right to their den, which is pretty neat. And they'll stay in their winter den until it warms up again and the green grass comes out. And then they'll move back kind of to the edges where they have access to um, some sorts of greenery. And I see a lot, there's lots of questions. Um, people are wondering what eats a porcupines. Um, Fisher is the number one predator, but the automobile is really the number one killer as, as attested by if you drive around, it's probably after squirrel, one of the most common um, roadkill things. They are not hibernators. They're active all winter long, though um, they slow down on really cold stormy days like today. Um, they might miss a meal not and choose not to waddle out and feed, but um, they, um, they are active all winter long. So let's see, I see Phil saying some good ways to find them is if you kind of go out um, and you find a bunch of hemlock um, branches or branchlets kind of nipped on the ground and look at the kind of edge of the hemlock branch and notice if it has a 45 degree angle. If it has a 45 degree angle, it means that they have um, been eaten by a rodent. That's a rodent bite and a porcupine is one of our larger rodents. Um, and there's a question out there about porcupine albino eyesight. Yes, albino um, Albinos typically have vision impairment, but I have to tell you that porcupines have really terrible eyesight to begin with. Um, they're kind of nearsighted and they don't see very well. Um, so I don't really know if it affects or impacts their sight any more than just being having a regular porcupine poor sight. Um, yeah, they, and Brett's saying they're not tidy with their latrines. Porcupines are probably um, one of the animals that um, have the messiest habits. They kind of poop right where they live all the time. Um, and you can find their kind of dens because you could find giant piles of scat. And if it's if they've been there generation after generation, the pile of scat can be almost as tall as I am, which is about five feet. Uh, and as they waddle around, um, they'll have, they'll just leave little scat as they go. And a lot of times, um, you'll find their kind of quill shed too. So this is a really good time of year to be looking for porcupine. And I'll look forward to maybe some um, next Ask a Naturalist photographs showing us some porcupine dens or some snips of hemlock branches. But let's move on and see what we have next. Oh, this we get this, this is a good question. And I, I'm going to read it, but I know a lot of people have seen something like this. I have been in Peterborough recently and have noticed foam or bubbles on the river surface. See the white bits in the attached photograph. I was wondering if this is an indicator of some kind of pollution, such as nitrogen or PFAS. Do you have any ideas? Thanks, Clint. It's from Brookline, Mass. And I heard that, Karen Siever, you have a response to this. 
Oh yeah, river foam. Anybody who spent time by a river knows river foam. Uh, multiple things can cause it. Um, this, given the timing, um, you can sort of see even in the reflection of the trees that it's fall. Um, this is, I see Andrea's putting in something about the chat about the leaves. It has to, it's really evidence of decomposition typically. And it, rivers tend to foam a lot in the fall because of all the leaf deposition to the water. And it's still warm enough for the decomposer microbes to be active in the water. So as they uh, lice and break apart the leaf cells, uh, that releases all sorts of different materials into the water. Uh, the foam is typically caused by a mixture of, of lipids, you know, fat, fat uh, molecules, and also proteins. And those act as surfactants, a lot like soap. Um, soap is very similar to that, something like a Dawn, like a dish soap. Um, and once you have that surfactant activity, that helps to break the surface tension of the water. And when that happens, it allows more air to mix with the water. And that's what really helps kind of churn up the foam and kind of make the suds. So that's my best guess for what's happening here. It's really kind of a, you know, abiotic evidence of biological activity. So it's nothing to be uh, concerned about um, necessarily. I don't think it's uh, PFAS or, or evidence of, of nitrogen de deposition. For the, la the latter, nitrogen deposition, that's when you usually typically get algal activity and you'll see sort of the, the green or bluish green evidence of that. So that's, that's my best guess. I don't know what other folks think, but that's my best uh, hypothesis for this look, which yes. is... Yeah, we've actually had this question before over um, in springtime. And so I'm just going to follow up. Do you also see it in spring? So is it spring and fall are typically when you see the this kind of foam? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can see it really any time of year. I did a lot of work along the Eshuela and Keene this, this fall. Uh, but even, even in August, there were even larger pieces of foam. So you can really see it any time of the year. And I would say what the, the organic material that starts the process might be a little bit different depending on the season and the microbes that are responsible for the decomposition might be a little bit different in terms of the, their diversity. But I think the, the chemical process is very similar. Very cool. Thanks, Karen. That was great. All right. Let's see what we have now. Here's just a close up. Oh, this is a twofer mystery. So I'll, I'll take the scat part and then we have a second part. So I'm gonna read it. It says, scat found near McDowell sandpit, coyote or bear? Holiday bonus question. What kind of bird remains? Didn't know bear or coyote, coyote ate birds. Thanks from Jim. P.S. I love, I love the Ask a Naturalist shows. They're really helping us get through these challenging times. Oh, thanks, Jim. We love them too. It's a highlight for all of us on the staff who participate, which is so cool. And I especially love the scat questions. And this scat is very exciting for me because we have been looking over the course of our Ask a Naturalist um, questions, we've had a lot of canid scat, that's coyote or fox scat. And if you've been, if you've tuned into some of the other shows, you'll know that I always say they're kind of twisty and they have the sort of um, twisted ends at the, at, at the tips. And they're segmented and each segment usually has a little twist. Um, kind of think about your dog, um, it's sort of similar to that, although a lot of times our dog scat, regular domestic dog, looks a little bit like this, but this is not dog. I, I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to suggest that this is a very exciting bobcat scat. And the reason I'm going with bobcat scat as opposed to coyote or bear is, um, and can you guys see my pointer? Yeah? Or no, Miles, maybe you could. Okay, so Miles, I'm going to have you point to um, the, not that one, but the big one that's um, to the side, kind of the separate one. Yes, that one. If you look at the, um, the ends of that, they're kind of what I would call pugs. And pugs, think about your cat. If you're cleaning out your cat's litter box, the um, segmentation on 
cat scat is kind of blunted at the end as opposed to canid scat, which is kind of each little one is its own little Tootsie Roll <laughs> wrap. But this is more blunted on the end and rounded. And that's why I am suggesting that this is perhaps Bobcat scat. Now, I can't say like I would bet my house on it or anything like that, but I'm going to give it my best thought that this might in fact be um, Bobcat scat. I've noticed that it has some um, feather quills in it, which is the second part of this. And that is maybe perhaps a little more evidence that it is bobcat. Um, bobcats are really um, good at catching grouse um, and turkeys. That's not their primary source of food, but it is something that they're um, versed at catching. And they're also good at climbing trees where birds are. And so they might have um, encountered a smaller bird in the trees. These are small quills. So um, I don't necessarily think they're from a big bird. Now I'm gonna turn the bird question over to um, Phil or Eric. I don't know if you can identify a bird based on what you're seeing here, but what do you think? It's challenging even with feathers. So uh, no, certainly I, I wouldn't have a guess at that, but um, but yeah, I would agree with you about Bobcat and um, uh, yeah, their habits make sense. I, I know that sand pit too, it tends to be, uh, it's very close to a marshy edge where I could see bobcats getting a hold of of some birds, maybe dwelling in the in the cattails and the shrubby edge of McDowell Lake. So, um, yeah, seems like a good area for hunting. Very cool. I'm so glad that you agreed because I felt like I was going a little bit out on a limb, but um, I don't know. It just didn't. It didn't speak coyote to me. It's something a little different. And thank you so much, Jim, for sending it in. And thanks for your kind comment about Ask a Naturalist. So, ah, aha. Okay, here comes the very next Turn the Tables. This is some tracks. You will have to identify it to the species. Our second Lida. correct. Lida, yes, this is the Eastern gray squirrel. Yes, so cool. Um, and I chose, I wanted to put this up because this is a track that we commonly, commonly see. And I know from tracking with lots of people that um, people get it confused. So what we're seeing are, Miles, I'll need your little pointer. If you could point to the two small feet, those are its front feet. Those are its two front feet. And then the two bigger feet, which are actually in front of it are its back feet. And that's because this is a leaper. And so the Eastern gray squirrel, just like the other squirrel, um, will have its hind feet pass its front feet when it's in the middle of a leap. And um, if you notice this um, kind of habitat, when you're out tracking on your own, um, Eastern gray squirrels will frequent more of the hardwood habitat and your red squirrel, which will be a much smaller track, but similar, you will find in your um, conifer forest. And so that's really exciting. Good job on Turn the Tables. I saw lots of correct answers flying in and congratulations to Lida and Andrea. You might have to, if you get the third question first, if you get that and we might have to send you an, a a secret prize. So let's see, we'll keep we'll moving on. We'll put her on the panel. We'll put her on the panel, guest panel for February, for January. I love that. Yeah, Andrea, she's into it. Okay. Oh, shh, quiet. This is a sound clip. So we are hearing the Eastern Coyote and everybody's got, yeah, everybody's hearing it. It's just great to hear. And this is, isn't really a question. This was recorded um, in Hancock um, from December 13th. And it's just a reminder that this is a good time of year to hear coyotes. First of all, um, in the winter night, sound travels further because the cold air and there's less leaves and kind of interference. So that's really exciting that we can go out. And this is the time of the year when the coyote packs, the family bonds kind of break up. 
um, and the male, the alpha male and the alpha female and all of their young from this year and the year before and even some um, unconnected coyotes in that pack, they kind of go their separate ways in the winter. And if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense because it's really hard in the winter to make a living if you're a coyote. And if you are trying to support a whole pack, that's hard. But if you are just a lone coyote and you're just responsible for feeding yourself, you have a better chance. So the young coyotes, this might be their first time kind of dispersing a little bit away from their pack. And they're not all, there's a lot of communication that's going on. And so that's why you can hear coyotes more often at this time of the year um, than other times of the year. And then you'll hear them again in the spring, early spring, when they kind of regroup and reform their pack. So um, I just thought that that's pretty cool. So let's see what's next on our right here. Susie, the question came in, was that snow coming down? Yes, it was a snowy night um, on that. It was uh, the last little bit of snow that we had. Yes, good. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay. Lately, we seem to have a surfeit of blue jays, often 10 or more on the ground or hanging from the side of our tube feeder trying to get seeds out. Is there a reason for so many jays this year? One, what is their normal diet? From Jim, and I know that I know that I've noticed that too. Maybe we'll see if Eric, Eric Masterson, you've got a response for this. Sure. Yeah, blue jays are um, like many birds are migratory. We don't think of them as being migratory because we have them in the winter too. But the ones that um, when you see an, when you see an abundance of blue jays like this, an uptick in blue jays, it's because they're coming in from somewhere else. This is not your local breeding pair or at least it's more than your local breeding pair that, that you have in your backyard in the summer. And um, we know this because actually if you, one of my favorites, um, I, I, I'm a student of migration. I just love migration. And one of the things I love to do in the fall in late October is watch the blue jays. And um, you can see gangs of blue jays, 30, 40, 50 birds flying um, south, uh, treetop to treetop. They're a, they're a, a, a diurnal migrant. And um, so what you have here is you have blue, jay blue jays that have come down from the north from Canada. And <clears throat> this pulse that you have at your bird feeder, it may not continue. It may not be like this in, in, in January or February. They may continue on south. But this is, um, this is a pulse of blue jays that, blue jays that have come, come south. And um, you, you've hit it up. They, you know, you've, you've taken this picture at peak blue jay time as your bird, bird feeder. So just the, the, the larger point here is that blue jays are migratory and uh, you, you, have, you have someone else's blue jays at your, at your bird feeder. And you, someone asked, so the question asks, what is their normal diet? So <clears throat> they, um, they have a pretty uh, Catholic diet. They, they eat, uh, they're, they're generalists, but one of the, one of the um, in, in terms of forest products, they're, they're um, fond of acorns and uh, beech nuts. And so when we have a dart of acorns or beech nuts, we have a dart of, of blue jays. And there was a, about two years ago, I think, when we had a terrible, uh, 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 the, the mast year was very, very poor. And we essentially lost all our blue jays. There were, there were reports coming in from across the state um, where people were um, noticing that the blue jays were, were completely gone. And so it's very much tied to the, uh, the available resource in the forest. Bill, do you want to chime in? Sure. Um, yeah, this, this is definitely one of those years where there are just a ton of acorns in the woods around us, um, dropping all over us when we're walking, dropping on our cars. I'm sure you've noticed it this fall. So there's really no reason for blue jays to go much further south than where we are, if they can find a good place. Um, I've been watching them all fall, just really busily stashing away acorns, flying with mouths full of things. Even today in the snow, they were moving around with, uh, with something in their bills, stashing food or maybe grabbing food that they had stashed away all winter, all fall. Um, so just a, a quick trend here. We look at these numbers really closely because this is the Christmas bird count season. And this coming weekend are the, uh, the Peterborough Hancock Christmas bird count on Saturday and the Keene Christmas bird count Sunday. So each year uh, I, I compile the Keene count. We, look at the numbers of all these different species 
and they vary from year to year. So in 2017, we had 365 Blue Jays in the Keene count. The next year, we only had 47 in 2018. Um, they rebounded again last winter a little bit, but I'm really curious to see what this winter brings for the bird count. Um, so it's fun to watch those, those fluctuations based on wild food. That's one of the easy ones that we can connect. Some like juncos, it's a little bit harder to tell what drives them except they're they're seed eaters and presumably the wild seeds are more abundant some years than others. So cool. Um, there was a follow-up kind of blue jay question and I don't know if Eric you already answered this um, in your you called it a pulse but I don't know here's the question certainly this is a party of jays but how many birds are needed to comprise a party? Same for a murder or a gaggle, what do you call them? And also, how do you tell a female blue jay from a male blue jay, can you? So here's, these are some follow-up blue jay questions. Well, I mean, so the, the, the blue jay is a member of a larger family of jays. And so some of the jays, the scrub jays, they have commensal um, nesting behavior where you'll have helper um, birds from, from prior from prior years that will hang around and help the uh, mom and dad raise young, but in general, they're, they're not colonial. And so when you see a big gang like this, this is, um, uh, that's what, what I call a pulse. And actually um, when you, the, the earlier photograph of the white wing cross coast, this is a flight year for a lot of birds coming south out of Canada. There's a, uh, it's a, um, an eruptive year for a lot of species of finch. And it's, uh, there's evidence to suggest that when the finches move south, very often the blue jays do too, so, which is why I think that we're getting uh, birds from farther north coming down. Um, but yeah, I mean these are just this is a this is this is a uh, party. They're they're so, they're not solitary. They're 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 social birds in the winter. They'll gang up in the winter and during migration. But when they breed, they're, they're not colonial breeders. So so this is non-breeding uh, season behavior. In terms of telling the male from the female, I actually, there's probably some subtle difference. I'm not aware of what it is. They're extremely similar. I, I'm guessing there's a subtle differences. Uh, very often there are even with birds that are similar um, between males and females. And there may be a very subtle size difference, but I'm actually not aware of what it is. Yeah, I would agree. And, and I would call a group of 10 or more blue jays a super spreader of blue jays. There you go. That's cute. I love it. Uh, very, very timely. Um, that's good. All right. Let's see what's happening next. Okay. Ooh, this is the mystery. Was it Colonel Mustard? Let's see. This showed up on my deck close to my slider door before my feeders were back up. It's clearly moss that has been growing on a tree. No trees close enough for it to have fallen off onto my deck and no visible moss on any of the trees near me. Remember, my deck is 20 feet off the ground. How on earth did it get here? Does anybody have any thoughts? Might have to ask Miles, he had a theory. And Miles, you don't often get to answer ask a naturalist questions, but you had a pretty good theory. Well, I often see moss growing on roofs and i was i don't know how how old this uh this building is or if we might need a new roof but there could be moss growing on it in which case with some heavy winds it could have blown off and uh landed on the on the deck there 20 feet up or uh or a reindeer could have been flying up there and knocked it off <laughs> well did you say a reindeer it's a reindeer. It was me. Ah. <laughs> okay. Um, distracting. I don't know. Does anybody else out in the audience have any any other theories? Any panelists want to chime in on this one? The mysterious moss. Very quiet out there. Can I say the, something? The only thing I I chime in on is that there's been a lot of wind lately. Yes, and Karen, you would like to add? Yes, Karen. Well, so once, believe it or not, I found a piece of pizza on my deck. <laughs> wind, wind does not explain your pizza. <laughs> no, this was not this year at all. And I thought, uh, you know, I'm in a condo. So there's a, another matching deck next to me on one side. 
and I thought, was somebody trying to throw their garbage over the deck and it landed on mine? But is there any reason any animal, I mean, remember I have racc raccoons all the time, you know, they're vi visitors, the bear has been there. Um, I'm sure the squirrels, of course, are there all the time. But some creature could have brought it. Not a reindeer, not a reindeer. Oh, why not? Reindeers <laughs> like pizza too. Um, and I hear Brett's wearing her pizza hat. Um, well, there's some some people suggesting that it might have been oh, a bird, um, like a crow or yeah. a raven. Um, and I'm wondering, Phil, what you think about that? Is a raven or a crow apt to kind of steal a piece of pizza and accidentally drop it? Yeah, that's a good guess. Um, sure, one of those compost bin raiders. Um, although moss, not as much. Uh, but <laughs> wait, Susie's a nice. reindeer now. Um, so yeah, uh, blue jays, crows, or ravens all come to mind, as well as the usual mammals. So we're we're suggesting that um, that the moss might have been just a wind deposit from a roof or someplace nearby, and perhaps there's been some other there's some really good um, kind of problem solving going on in the chat. But we don't have a definitive answer for this. And what we'd like to say is, if this keeps occurring, uh, <laughs> let us know because then that that's interesting. And maybe check out and see, is there moss growing on any roofs nearby? Um, so we're curious about that. It would be boring if we knew it all. All right, let's see what is next. I think this might be turn the tables. You have to put in the definition of this word, which is brumation. Do we have any, a winner? Well, it's tough because Jim, Jim Talbert said partial hibernation and um, hibernation is, is is it, but the specific term, the reason we're not saying hibernation or saying brumation is because it's typically refers to reptiles, which um, Allie Flynn said, slowing down in cold weather for reptiles. So they're kind of both right in slightly different ways. Even though Jim's came in first, Allie got the reptile piece, which is, um, I think sort of key for, for the idea of brumation because for mammals, you wouldn't say you, you would say hibernation. You would Let's say give a hat to both of them. I agree. There you go. Two we hats. Give two hats. If you can send your address two miles in the <laughs> chat, he yep. will take it down and we'll send you a hat um, tomorrow, Miles. Will the hats go out? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. So this okay. is what brumation is. Yeah, our turtles. Think about your turtles right now out there underneath the pond ice that's starting to form, sitting on the pond bottom on the mud, slowing way, way down. This is their time for brumation. Love it. All right, thank you. That was our last turn the tables for this evening. Um, but we have a, I think, ah, this is, this is good. Sending you a picture and a short video. Watch the bobcat for about 20 minutes. It started by the stone wall next to conservation area. It proceeded to slowly work its way toward the middle of the field and closer to the driveway. It sat there for a few minutes and then ran back to where it started. You will have to zoom in to each picture. It was really cool, but cannot let my dog out alone anymore. Let's watch the video and then we'll discuss what it might be doing. Wow, that's really exciting. Um, and wow, how lucky to be able to see that. And briefly, um, you might have noticed in that video, the bird feeder. And I think that is an interesting, um, an interesting thing. So um, I don't necessarily think you need to worry about your dog unless your dog is very small. Um, but I would suggest, and if you follow all kind of fish and game suggestion and other wildlife, um, I would suggest that 
when you are having your dog out, you should be outside with your dog at the same time. And that will help cut down on any um, possible predation. But um, bobcats are not big predators of our house pets. I just did a quick um, review of Rory Carroll, who was an incredible bobcat wildlife biologist who spoke for the Harrison. I reviewed his work that he did on the stomach content analysis of bobcats. He compared kind of the hist historical stomach contents of bobcats up until the 1950s. And then he did a current, a, a more current. And what he found out is that um, bobcats nowadays really make most of their living eating a lot of squirrels and um, rodents. And that might have to do with how many of us feed the birds. So when we're feeding the birds, we're also feeding the rodents. And when we feed the rodents, it draws in the rodent hunters, um, such as the bobcat or the fox or the raptors and the owls. And when he did studies of the contents of the bobcat's um, DNA, kind of like when he looked at kind of the, the what made up the food, he found that um, inside the bobcat, it was actually made up of a lot of corn, human, human corn. Like what, what they're doing is they're eating the animals that eat the bird seed and eat the corn that's in the bird seed. And so they're ending up with kind of like our human corn in them, which is it's just interesting. So um, we're, seeing, we're seeing more bobcats by our bird feeders um, because they are getting used to hunting there. It's a good source of food for them. And um, they're flexible carnivores, which is good for them because they're generalist, which means they have more likely to survive um, our human encroachment. So I don't know if anybody has any questions, but if not, we'll move on because we're running low on time. Yeah, in we're, fact, Susie, we're, yeah. we're kind of out of time. Do you want to save that last slide for next month? Sure. We will save the last slide for next month and hopefully see all of you back here and more of you. And if you have some more questions um, or mysteries that you find, please send them to us. We especially love... Um, audio, video, photos, mysteries, anything you've got. And in the meantime, I wanna thank everybody for showing up tonight for Ask a Naturalist. I wanna wish everybody a lovely holiday. A special thanks to all the panelists and the Harris Center staff and founders of the Harris Center out there for coming. 